Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, and it's my job to help you to put the pieces of the product puzzle together. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings, and expert advice of world-class UX design and product management professionals. My guest today is Steve Krug. Yes, the Steve Krug, as in the one who wrote the world-famous UX book, Don't Make Me Think, a common sense approach to web and mobile usability, which is now in its third edition and has sold over 600,000 copies in 20 languages. First published in 1999, Don't Make Me Think is still considered to be essential reading for anyone entering the field of user experience. Steve is also the author of Rocket Surgery Made Easy, the do-it-yourself guide to finding and fixing usability problems, an excellent, practical, and incredibly useful how-to book for anyone who wants to learn and improve their usability testing skills. For over 25 years, Steve worked as a usability consultant through his firm, Advanced Common Sense, where he helped clients including Apple, Bloomberg, Lexus, NPR, and the International Monetary Fund to remove friction from experiences. Now, he spends most of his time writing or watching old movies on TV when he should be writing. Those were his words, not mine. He's an exceedingly generous contributor to the field. He says what he thinks, and he's here with me today. Steve, welcome to the show. Hi, nice to be here. Or I'm in my basement, but nice to meet you. <laughs> well, it's great to have you here. And I obviously thoroughly enjoyed researching uh, for this conversation. I mean, your experience in the field and contribution to the field, as I said, is, is almost unparalleled. Hundreds of thousands of people have really come to understand the, the power of UX and usability through your works. And when I was looking back at your history, and in particular, the illustrative style of the books that you've written. You were a child in the 1950s and 60s, and you can really see that come through in in those illustrations. (laughs) Who was Don Herbert and what influence did he have on you? Uh, Ah, Don Herbert, yeah. Um, He had a TV show, a Saturday morning TV show uh, called Watch Mr. Wizard, and he was Mr. Wizard. And uh, the premise of the TV show was that he brought two neighborhood children into his home workshop or laboratory and taught them scientific principles. So he would do things like the experiment where you uh, hang a bowling ball from a wire on a wire from the ceiling and you ha- have you have little Billy stand back a ways from where it's hanging and you pull the ball back so it's right up against his chin, chin and you let it go. You go to let it go and you say, do you think if I let this go, it's ever, it's going to come back further than where I let it go from. And, mm-hmm. let it go and obviously it doesn't kill him. So, so, uh, but he was, <laughs> he was great at teaching scientific principles. And I loved it. I was like, you know, really fascinated by electricity and science. And, um, and I just thought it was wonderful. It was one of my favorite shows. And, and so I kind of, uh, I, I say that as much as I ever had a career objective, it was to get his job when he retired because I just thought that was the best job. And, mm. um, uh, and the interesting thing is he actually never retired. Uh, he, he did it for years and then he stopped doing it. And then many years later in the early nineties, he came back and started doing it again uh, mm. and did it for a couple of years. And then when he did finally retire, uh, a guy named Bill Nye, the science guy, uh, did the same thing. And it was essentially the same show, except without this, the school kids. Lucky for Don Herbert, when he made his comeback, he didn't actually take his job. But it did make me wonder, because one of your hallmarks when you give talks about usability testing is to give the live demo. And yeah. I wondered if uh, if Don Herbert was the um, inspirational part thereof of the live demo. I, I never thought of that, but it, I probably had a hand in it. Yeah. And I love doing the live demos. I think the live demo, the live demo is partly because um, seeing, if you haven't watched a usability test before, seeing one is pretty eye opening. I find it's, it's, it's very mm. eye opening. And so it always seemed to me to be the best way to start off any talk about it. Cause you'd have people who hadn't seen one and, and it's like, you do a 10 minute usability test and they're sitting there going, Oh my God, that was, that was like, there was, he, he didn't do anything and yet 
<laughs> you learned an enormous amount in 10 minutes about the thing that, that they were doing the demo test on. So, so it's very, yeah, you, you're effective. like Mr. Magician to them it's sort of sh show, not tell, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, 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 you, and I used to bring somebody up, you know, uh, if I was doing the workshop, I would bring somebody up from the audience, you know, and actually do the kind of, we've never met before kind of thing. Uh, just like a magician, you know, I really, really hmm. love kind of like that. Um, and one of the things that was always interesting to me was uh, after I've been doing them for for some years, I was at a conference and and mentioned it mentioned that I did them in in a talk and a whole bunch of people who were who were UX professionals UX didn't exist at the time this is still usability days um, mm -hmm. came up to me afterwards and and several of them said um, you actually do that you do a, you do a live demo it's like it's like isn't that risky and, and I was like. <laughs> No, the thing, the, the lovely thing about it is it always works. You you know, even if it's a bad test, even if it's a bad participant, as long as the audience can hear and understand them, it works perfectly. You know, it works mm -hmm. exactly as well as you need it to. So. Mm -hmm. so fast forward roughly 40 years, it's 1989, and you get started in UX by doing contextual inquiry for semantics utilities division. Yeah. Before we get into that specific part of your experience, what did your professional journey look like up until that point? Yeah, it was, it was, uh, as my son would say, random. It was very random, um, <laughs> I, I, but it's not quite what he means by random. Um, I, I, I got an English uh, lit degree in, um, in college, which I, I I proudly can say I've never made any use of it all or perceived any benefit to me from it in, in the rest of my life. So, so, you know, that's just by way of encouraging people who feel like, oh, I got this degree and I don't know if I'm ever going to use it. Yeah, maybe not. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> college and, was maybe a little less expensive back when you got that degree though, right? My, my yes, my, my, my tuition was like, um, $2,100 a semester, as opposed to now on average, it would be like 50 to 75,000 a year. So yeah, mm -hmm. it was significantly mm -hmm. less. Uh, and I think that it, that included room and board. So then I worked in a typesetting shop, friend, mm -hmm. friend of mine through odd series of coincidences, uh, had a top typesetting shop and I started off as a proofreader. And then typesetting was getting computerized at the time. And I was the person who was more interested in computers than anybody else. So I learned how to keep the computers running and taught everybody what, how to use them and whatnot. And mm -hmm. that was how I really got into computers. Um, and then I ended up uh, doing tech writing for 10 years. I wrote manuals, user manuals, uh, because a, a sister-in-law of a friend of mine uh was a tech writer and she had a job that she didn't have time to do and she said oh, you have an english degree she didn't know it. <laughs> um you know how to write and and uh why don't you try this so i did and i ended up doing it for 10 years um, so your degree did actually pay off in some way shape or form in in, in that in just that sense that it fooled somebody into thinking <laughs> that i could write which turned which actually was true i could write but that had nothing to do with the degree you know, people ask me how to how do I get it? How do I get at the job? And how do I get into the field and whatever? And and the usual advice is is well, you got to network. And I realized that the truth of my career was I never networked. Uh, I would have been terrible at it. It was just com I'm completely <laughs> temperamentally unsuited to it, and would have found it embarrassing. And 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 I realized that all the job changes that I got were through nepotism. That basically it was a friend or a family or somebody who uh, uh, suggested that I should I should try this. And so my my advice to people looking to to for their careers now is um, develop friends who are smarter and more ambitious than you are, and they'll get really good jobs. And then they'll be looking around for somebody to hire. Or so because I've been through a bunch of that. And that was how I got into, that was how I got into the usability and the contextual inquiry it was a friend of mine who who um, was working for he was working for Symantec actually first and then later he worked for Apple mm -hmm. and that was how he got ended up consulting for Apple. 
Never underestimate the power of a good group of friends. Yeah, exactly. So you get to Semantic. It's 89. Yep. This is presumably your first foray into usability and UX. Did they hire you to do these contextual inquiries specifically? They did. Uh, I, I, I mean, my, my foray into UX had started actually with my last tech writing job, which was right before mm -hmm. that where the the developers who were these wonderful people who were who ended up eventually doing two other that startup failed but they eventually ended up doing two other startups that changed industries um and i was writing manual for them and they mm -hmm. realized that because i was writing the manual i was spending more time thinking about the interface than they were because <laughs> basically, if you're writing a user guide for something, you're explaining where the interface doesn't work the way you would expect it to work. That's all you're, you know, that's really all you have to write. <laughs> and so they invited me to sit in on the design meetings for the interface. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of how, that was kind of the initial sort of segue. But then this friend of mine was working for Symantec and his boss basically said, uh, maybe we should know something about our users, you know? we're trying to figure out what products we should develop. Maybe we should learn some more about our users. And so Richard said, well, I know this guy. And they hired me to do four or five interviews where I would go out and sit with somebody in their office space and talk to them about Symantec products and, and how they did their work and what they needed and whatever. And then I did, did a report and uh, include, actually I included um, an edited segment from a Marx Brothers movie in the report, which was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> what was the segment? I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure how, how I, I don't know how I did that then, because how would I have done <laughs> the video? Anyway, I did. Uh, I took like a, 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 you know, a six minute scene in a Marx Brothers movie and edited it down to about two. It was a scene from uh, At the Races where Groucho buys from Chico, I think it's actually pronounced Chico, not Chico. Um, mm -hmm. uh, well, Ch Chico was a, a racetrack tout and he was selling tip books. And so he sold one to, to Groucho and Groucho flips through the book and says, well, so what's this? What does this mean? And he says, oh, oh, you need a code book. And he sells him a code book and <laughs> tells him another, another book that he needs to do it. And, and he ends up with a wheelbarrow full, full of these books. And and I, you know, the point I was making was this is kind of people's experience with these products is that, that you know, they, they just are constantly having to learn more about the product just to get it to do what it was supposed to do in the first place. And really subtle, Steve. So, yeah, <laughs> it was, it was really good. I still have it around someplace and, and, and it was, uh, um, and I guess that sort of, I mean, I, I guess that was, um, uh, that's as close as I can think of to something that indicated um, how I was going to turn out, you know, I mean, that was, that mm. was, that was kind of still what I do to this day is mm. taking that kind of attitude towards it. But do you recall the reaction when, when you played the video? Uh, they were, they, they thought it was funny and they were, they were, yeah. very, they were very pleased, you know, it's like, it's, it was an interesting presentation. So there you go. Mm. Everybody's, everybody's bored at work. So, um, <laughs> because the, because his boss liked that so much. Uh, somebody, uh, I don't know who it was said, well, maybe we should try some of this usability testing stuff. And I hadn't done any at that point. And I actually just dug, uh, I, um, bought Jacob Nielsen's early book, um, mm -hmm. usability engineering, uh, where he describes usability testing and, and I taught myself from that and did some usability tests for them. And they, and that was really good. And they liked that. And so then I became a consultant. Do you, do you have a relationship with Jacob? I do. I haven't seen him for many years now. I mean, partly because, uh, you know, we would see each other at, at conferences. Um, mm. and, uh, and Jacob, I went to the usability professionals conference more often Jacob than Jacob. He didn't go every year. Um, but mm. when he was there, we would get together and, mm. and, and, um, I, I have always enjoyed Jacob. I like Jacob. Um, but I was indebted to him. I mean, you know, I sort of learned in the first place, learned what I knew from him and he's mm. obviously written tons of useful stuff about all of it. Um, mm. and the biggest difference was he was a high end consultant and I wasn't. <laughs> you were an aspiring high end consultant. <laughs> I wasn't, well, I, I don't know if I, I aspired to be high end consultant. I, I, that, that was, 
I felt like that was always beyond me. I, you know, you, you had to, you had to be able to go in and sell to business people to be a high end mm -hmm. consultant and like networking. I sort of knew this was not in my, uh, you know, portfolio. Uh, I mm -hmm. would not be good at, at doing that. And mm -hmm. it would require a completely different kind of confidence than I had. I had a lot of confidence in what I did, but I wouldn't have had confidence doing that. It would have been way too much stress. So. Mm -hmm. Thinking about more recent times, I believe your son, Harry studied user interface design at the grad program at Bentley in Boston. Um, how much? Yeah. UX really. Yeah. yeah. UX. Yeah. Um, how much of a role did you play or your influence play in his decision to pursue that course of study? Um, I would characterize it. I was shocked when he said he was interested in doing it. <laughs> uh, why were you shocked on the I, 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 I don't know would you want to do what your father did mm. I mean, maybe but somehow it just never occurred to me that he would um, mm. and I I, I, I I again this was a joke but w what I like to say was that I, I thought he uh, part of his reason for being interested in it was that he, his office where he did his homework and projects and whatnot was right outside mm. my office in the basement here. And I, I assumed that over the years, he came to the conclusion that I didn't really do any work, at least not any hard work. <laughs> and that made it seem like a possibly an attractive career. <laughs> and what's, what's his reality being? Um, I've done some work um, mm -hmm. and th then decided to do the, the, the program at Bentley and finish the program at Bentley sort of right before COVID. So oh, right. yeah. uh, he's, he's uh, uh, currently looking for a job. Yeah. Well, if there are any UX hiring managers listening to the show today, yeah. if, you, if you want yeah. a, a Krug on the team, there's, a, there's, there's one that would be keen to hear from you. He's, he's, very, ni he's very nice. He's very funny and he's sharp as a tack. Um, and uh, I, I would recommend him highly. Uh. <laughs> no bias at all, but, <laughs> but I'm sure it's highly accurate. No bias, no bias intended. I know he's a great kid. So. How do you think he feels being in the same field as his father, you know, someone like yourself who's had such a, a noticeable impact on, on UX? You know, oddly, I, I, the few times we've talked about it or somebody else has mentioned it, um, my impression is it doesn't bother him at all. You know, he's like completely, completely tranquil with it. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, he was, when he was in, in, in uh, class at Bentley, um, uh, we were both very impressed that almost nobody made the connection, you know? <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that kind of st stunning? Um, mm. I, I think it, you know, I think it came up in, in one or two classes at some point it came up, but uh, yeah, so mm. he didn't, he didn't have to think about it at all. So, mm. but I, I, no, I've never gotten the sense that he w would mind, mind that at all. He feels, feels pressured by it. You know, he's his mm. own person. Mm. So if you've been someone who's effectively for a large part of their career being paid to find problems and experiences and things on the screen mainly, yeah. do you have trouble suspending disbelief as you go through everyday life and everyday experiences? Do you see problems that other people don't see in normal things? Um, no, not quite where I thought you were headed. Uh, mm. uh, I, uh, no, I don't think I, 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 I run into enough problems without looking for trouble. And I, like, <laughs> and, I, and I feel like they're the same problems everybody else runs into, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, wh what I suspected you might be about to ask was, um, d doesn't it make me crazy or don't? So people ask me sometimes, are you like seeing usability problems all the time? And so it's really frustrating for you, mm. uh, which is not true. Uh, mm. I, it's, the usability problems are frustrating, but no more than for everybody else. You know, I, I, I kind of, I kind of, and maybe I'm even a little more tolerant because I kind of know how hard it is to get it all right. You know, 
Well, let's pick up on that topic because there's something else that I know that isn't easy for you, although you've done a whole lot of it, including writing two critically acclaimed books in the field of usability and UX. Yeah. People that are listening might find it interesting to hear that you really loathe writing. Why is that? Because it's really hard work. <laughs> it's really hard work. <laughs> there are people who say, if it's not really hard work, then you're not doing it well. You know, that's the, kind of the only reason why it would not be really hard work. Um, be, because because it amounts to thinking and thinking is hard work. Thinking clearly is really hard work. Um, and the other part of it is, is then thinking clearly and figuring out what you mean and then coming up with a really good explanation for it, which is the Mr. Wizard part. You know, he mm. figured out how to make the principles clear and mm. that clarity is, is really tough. But so, so over the years, I've always said that I, that I, I hated writing and that I would, couldn't understand why anybody wouldn't, anybody would write unless they had at least a metaphorical gun, like a headline, had the dead, deadline pointed at their head. Yeah. Um, Cause I just find it so painful, but, but I, I had a breakthrough like sometime in the last five years when I suddenly realized that I don't actually hate writing that much. What I hate is procrastinating. And for me, 90% <laughs> of writing is procrastinating. <laughs> This is and procrastinating is really painful. So, mm. two sides of the same coin. It's interesting that it, you managed to come to that realization and differentiate be, between the writing and the procrastination. Yeah, I mean, because I, 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 well, I've been working. On, as you know, from from looking at my site, I've been been working for years in the background on a book about writing, about making mm. writing easier, which is kind of my main interest at the moment. Um, and um, I ended up thinking about procrastination a lot mm. to the point where I have like a, a I have like a 80 page draft that's some text and a lot of notes about procrastination for what could it most be like a 10 page chapter on procrastination. So Mm. And I've been working on it for a long time. Well, that, that's irony right there, or, isn't or it? Or not working on it for a long time. Yeah, the irony is there, just really thick. So. Um, what did you realize about procrastination? Uh, a lot of things, actually. Uh, the, probably the main one, people don't have to buy the book. Um, the main one is you have to get over the idea that you're going to fix it. You have to get over the idea that you are going to stop procrastinating. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that, uh, uh, it's not one thing. It's, 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 it's a, it's a number of things working at the same time. And, uh, so if you read an article about procrastination, and it says, oh, do this, you know, do set aside a time every day when you're going to do, and just do a little bit every day. And, blah, blah, blah. and the fact is. Any of those things will, will it's kind of like a dieting. Any of them will work for a mm. little while and they'll stop working. That's, uh, you know, this is like the rule. It's, it's not. And part of the reason why they stop working is because while you may be successfully tamping down one of the things that makes you procrastinate, you've got like six others. And so one of the others will surface. And then the thing that you're doing will stop working because the other one will become in the forefront. And mm. we'll think that you will think that you stopped procrastinating because that thing that you were trying didn't work, but it's really because one of your other reasons for procrastination, procrastinating became more activated. It's a really real human behavior, isn't it? To, to, to put off doing what you know needs to be done or what you believe needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I, and most people I think uh, suffer from it to, to some, mm. to some degree. And part of it is that 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 um, we tend to believe a lot of the wrong things about it. Like like a lot of people believe, as I have believed at various times in my life, that you're putting it off because you're lazy, because you don't want to do hard work. And that's not it. That's just not it. I mean, maybe for some people, I'm sure there's some percentage of people who that that's true for. But hmm. really, what it is is you're putting off feeling bad. You're, you're putting off things that, 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 that make you feel bad, whether it's you feeling that you're not going to be able to do it or the feeling that you're not going to do a good enough job or 
uh, whatever, but that it's a way of avoiding, putting it off as a way of avoiding those, those feelings. Mm. And, and just understanding that, actually, there, there's a bunch of things I think just understanding them helps some. As I say, not going to fix it, but it can make it better. Mm. So. I'd, I'd wondered if you hated writing so much because of the time you spent writing technical manuals. Oh, technical manuals were a nightmare. I mean, technical manuals, for me, when I started doing them, I would be so miserable because I had n no idea how to do it, no idea how to get started, and no sense at all that I actually could get it done. Like, no sense that I could get it done. And it wasn't until I did my, like, my last manual that I finally felt like, oh, I know how to do this. You know, I can, mm. this is like, not, this is something I can do. And that took, like, eight, ten years to get to that point. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that's mostly about, it's mostly about, about avoiding bad feelings. And, and the, the reason why we do it so much is because it works. It's, a, it's you know, it, 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 it works until it doesn't work. You know, uh, it works until either that the uh, sense of, uh, you know, that things are coming at you and you're going to be in trouble uh, uh, outweighs the relief of not doing it. <laughs> yeah. And then um, you have to act. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or yeah. And, and for me, it was always, for me, it was, you know, people talk about deadlines and, and, um, there's this, there's actually this wonderful quote, quote from Douglas Adams from, um, you know, who wrote, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, mm -hmm. a very famous quote, which is, um, I, I, I'll get, I'll get one of the words wrong, but it's something like, um, I, uh, I love deadlines. I like the whirring sound they make as they go by. Uh, <laughs> it's, Cause he was, he was notorious for, he missed deadlines by years. Like his second book, I think was like six years late or something like that. Mm. So it would be, it'd be unfair for, for me then to, to ask you whether you've put a self-imposed deadline on your no, book about writing. Yeah, one of the nice things about this project and why I'm, I'm still happy about it is I have no, I have no deadline, you know, sort of nobody else is involved. My self-imposed deadline is that I hope to get it done while I still have enough brain cells left to get it done. <laughs> I, I, I think it would be a great book. I really am, am very enthused about it. And, and every time mm. I go to work on it, I'm very enthused about it, which is kind of remarkable. Because mm. um, uh, I do, I do, there's a, a part, of, part of me in my gut that really feels like, oh, this would be a really good book. So, mm. um, of course, there's a huge distance between thinking it would be a really good book and having it written. <laughs> well, you, you wrote two really good books or, already. I mean, I think no one could argue against that. And you mentioned earlier when you were talking about the writing process that the uh, the thinking is actually the really hard part and then shaping that thinking into um, a condensed form that you can then convey it with meaning to other people so that right. they can then do something with it right. is something that you've done exceptionally well. Uh, and, and thank you. Uh, I, 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 I do. I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I actually believe that, that I'm, I'm very grateful that, that things have worked out that way. Hold that thought, because I just remembered mm. um, what I was thinking about deadlines, which is that um, for me, deadlines it, it, deadlines weren't useful at all because I wouldn't I wouldn't kick into gear when the deadline was approaching and I knew that I was about to disappoint the publisher or miss some date that they needed to do for the printer or whatever. That wouldn't help at all. It was only once all of that had been passed and I was and I had completely messed things up that I would finally lapse into enough panic that I would actually get it done. So this is I was really worst case scenario and I feel very bad. I want to apologize in the book for all the people who I have made miserable. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the record now. <laughs> oh, they know. I mean, they know. I just feel like they owe. They deserve another huge apology. So thinking about your first two books, yeah. I know you've done some revisions to Don't Make Me Think already. Yeah. Is there anything thinking about those books now that you 
wish you had included or would add if you felt compelled to do any further revisions? I, I honestly, I, it's kind of satisfying because I can't say that I've thought of anything since either mm. of the most recent revisions, as you say, one, one was just the, the rocket surgery. I just did the first edition. Um, and don't make me think I did, I don't know, six years ago, I think I did the third edition, something like that. Um, mm. I can't say that there's anything that after, after the fact I thought, oh, I should have said that back then. It's all, it's all, the only things that I want to do are things that either have changed to some extent or that I've sort of learned more, but it, it wasn't like there was anything that I should have known at the time that I feel mm. any regret for not, not having done. Um, mm. and, uh, it's, it's, um, doing it, doing a, a new edition of a book is, is it's a ridiculous amount of work. It's, it seems like it should be relatively easy. Um, mm. but if you're doing it halfway decently, it's a ridiculous amount of work. So, so that's why, you know, and, and also as of a couple of years ago, I, my thinking was always there's not really that much that i could add at this point there's not really that much that i would change or, or could mm -hmm. add that would be useful enough to, to bother doing it um but then somehow in the last year and a half maybe uh starting before covid uh, i i without thinking about it i started things started occurring to me that i could mm -hmm. do it or ways that i actually could update them that mm -hmm. hopefully might not be that much work, although inevitably it would end up being that much work, but, but I could fool myself into thinking it might not be that much work, um, that would be worth doing. So, so now they've gone from, I don't see any reason to do that to, yeah, I probably should do that, but I'd, I'd rather do the writing book first, but maybe I should do one of them first, but I don't know. Um, so you mentioned you were really proud of don't make me think and yeah. the, the numbers would suggest you know with over six hundred thousand copies sold that a lot of people found a lot of value in that book it propelled you to be uh, a household name in the ux community how as i like how does that feel i i like to characterize it as a relatively big fish in a very small pond <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's better to be a relatively big fish in a small pond than a, than a very oh, small fish no, in a large pond. No, it's wonderful. I highly recommend it. I mean, you know, I think, <laughs> I think being, being a big fish in a huge pond is, pro, you know, as we know, is probably a nightmare, you know. Mm -hmm. So this is probably the best of all possible worlds where I, I have people sending me email, lovely email all the time. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, what, what more could you ask for? You know, that's that's so cool uh unless it was like actually you know curing cancer or something you know that would be better that would be much better but, um so um uh, yeah so no i'm i feel very fortunate to be in in that position and and i feel even more fortunate because i actually do i kind of do agree you know i mean as i said earlier uh, i i think it's a really good book you know this that's that's really nice you know mm. there are a lot of things about it that i like so oh, very much every once in a while I'll go back and look at it and say, oh, yeah, that was pretty good. Mm. <laughs> yeah, they must feel really good. And I, I noticed in your dedications to the book, you obviously, in the first edition, you yeah. uh, dedicated it to your mother and father. And in yeah. the second edition, you dedicated it to your big brother, Phil. Yeah. What, what influence did Phil have on your life when you were growing up? Uh, he tickled me a lot. <laughs> like literally <laughs> the old the old big brother sits on you and tickles you you know it's like that, that was um he was just he was i mean it was great to have a brother I, I i must say it was great to have a brother and he was um he was nice to me you know uh mm. when he didn't have to be i mean i i, <laughs> I actually I, I actually my memory of myself as a kid is that i was a brat i was like really annoying I have checked this with with some neighbor some neighbor friends, who said no, not really, you know. So so I, I guess to some extent it's not, it's not true, but um, but uh, he was he was really good with me. He was really patient with me, and uh, uh, you know that's huge. That's mm. Huge. Mm. So. 
and then he was he was also he was also uh this incredibly decent person you know uh, so that's always nice it's nice to have people in your family who you think of as as very decent he worked he was a, a legal services uh attorney in in harley he worked in harlem for almost all of his career um uh, you know helping people not get evicted yeah. uh, and he was really hard working and he uh it was impressive sounds like an amazing amazing big brother it's great to have people like that yeah. in, in, in your life to look up to yeah what is the single biggest lesson that you hope people take away after reading don't make me think oh uh, i guess that that uh, you if you're building something that you i mean it always comes it always comes down to the usability testing which you probably shouldn't which is if you if you if you're building something then you're not going to be able to see where it's going to confuse people. It's not going to confuse you. You know too much about it. And if you really want it to work well, you have to put in that effort of uh, watching some people try to use it because it will just improve mm. it. You can improve mm. it dramatically just by doing that. Mm. That's probably my biggest takeaway, uh, which is why the second book was about how to do usability testing because I really do believe in it. Um, and have we gotten better or worse at this as a as a practice over the past 20 to 30 years uh, uh, the practice of doing usability testing the practice of designing better stuff of making sure that we yeah put things in front of our users and learn how to improve them yeah, and design I, them better i think that's become much more it's become much more accepted thing you know i mean that's mm. certainly it was it was relatively rare for that to be part of the development process 20 years ago you know, people mm. did it, but, but it was relatively rare. And it was, and one of the reasons why I did rocket surgery is because it was pretty much always handed off to consultants, you know, mm. so it was expensive. So you might do one round of usability testing during the, you know, development the life cycle of, of a product. Uh, if you were a huge company, you were building a huge product, then you'd pay for a bunch of rounds. But, but for the most part, if you weren't, then you'd be lucky if you did it once. Mm. Uh, and I think that's changed. I think, you know, there are so many more, more people now who are in one way or another doing UX work. Uh, and there is such a thing as enterprise UX. And uh, it, you know, it, it, I don't know how many people are doing UX work now, but I'm sure it's, it's, you know, five to 10 times as many as there were 20 years ago, probably 10 times as many as there were 20 years ago. People yeah. consider themselves in some way doing UX. So that's great. I'm still surprised at how much stuff is not what it should be. I'm surprised, I guess. You know, it's not what surprises you in particular. That it's not that hard to run into a usability problem. It's not that yeah. hard to run into a glaring usability problem, you know. So, uh, but I guess it's because people are building so much stuff, you know, they're building far more stuff than they were 20 years ago. Have we seen the end of the usability consultant? Um, well, no, I mean, they're called, they're called UX researchers now, mm. uh, you know, they're called either they're, they're, it's become UX researchers and UX designers. And it's hard to say what that really, you know, what that really means. Um, and, and, you know, from my perspective, it, it kind of all changed with, with, um, Steve Jobs and the iPhone and the, uh, you know, and the other products to a certain extent, but, but that Steve Jobs proved that by doing UX work, you could make products better and sell more, you know, and before that, I don't think that was a belief uh, that people had. In fact, I always used to say, I, did, I didn't think that was ever going to happen. I didn't think UX and usability was ever going to become a, a required line item uh, you know, top level mm. line item in budgets, the way marketing or, you know, whatever, but, but now to a lot, pretty good extent it has, you know, it's like, I don't mm. know any company of any size that, or even smaller companies that would think of, you know, partly due to the, to the lean movement. I mean, that certainly didn't hurt either, but I think it started mm. with jobs that basically people said, oh, we got to get some of that stuff. Uh, they're making money with it. So, 
We often think about UX and usability as making people's lives better. And I, I believe firmly that 99% of practitioners in the field want to do that. But is there a dark side to usability and user experience? Oh, uh, yeah, there's, there's, uh, um, the, I, I think, I think people are under pressure to, uh, this is one of the things I did talk about at some point years ago is, was, I feel like it's one of the things that happened has happened to usability is that people are under pressure to use user research for purposes, you know, they, that originally they were user advocates and now mm -hmm. they're being asked to use user research for things that are not in the user's interest. Uh, uh, you know, how do we, how do we shave another, uh, you know, fraction of a percent of clicks off of this sort of, whether it's good, for, whether it's in the user's interest or not. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what happened. That's one of the things that it's one of the unintended consequences when people say, oh, well, UX, okay, UX stuff works. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden the people who, you know, have those, have, those impure motivations come out of the woodwork and they start leaning on the people doing the UX to do that. So, so yeah, there are certainly, I mean, dark practices are, are a real thing. Um, and, uh, it's unfortunate. And that, and now, and so the backlash to that is, is a big surge in discussion of ethics in the UX field. So for the last three or four years, that's become a hot conference topic mm. is ethics. So I've heard you say that, and I'm going to quote you now, that there, and I'm quoting now, there are really <laughs> few absolute truths when it comes to usability and UX design. Yeah. What did you mean by that? Well, it's just, I uh, like the, the comic that I had in, in the book where people are trying to decide whether they should use pull downs, the drop downs in the interface, you know, and it's like what they want is an answer that, that drop downs are good or drop downs are bad. And the fact is, if you've been involved in any, you know, serious design process, you know, that it's, it's, it's all contextual, you know, it's like drop downs are not good everywhere or not bad everywhere. Depends on mm. how much stuff you want to put in the drop down, how much space you have available on the page, how often the user needs to interact with it. So there are very few hard and fast rules mm. other than the kind of high level generic things. Like you need to make it as clear as possible, <laughs> you know, uh, you need to keep the the user aware of the status of the system at any given time and be transparent. And, and mm -hmm. there are some, you know, some of those basic principles which have been around for a long time, but they're just basic principles. Uh, and that's kind of it that, you know, people always kind of want hard and fast rules. They want answers and there aren't mm -hmm. that many answers. Uh, it's possible mm -hmm. to get people, you know, there are many things you can read that will suggest how to think about the answers but you still have to think about them in your context. There's still, you're still making judgment calls. You still have to do the hard work. I have to do the hard work. <laughs> you have to think about it. <laughs> so, and hopefully you think about it with the user in mind, you know? Yeah. And so there's no better technique than to, to think about it with the, the user in mind than actually putting the user in front of something and uh, observing them. So let's I, talk about testing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Assuming you agree with that statement. No, I do. I, I, I kind of want to, I mean, it's one of the things I would li like to add to, to don't make me think um, it's not much, but it's kind of a, a diagram or, or both books actually. It's kind of a diagram showing how I think of the process that you've got the person in front of the screen doing a thing. They've got a speech balloon, what they're saying that you're listening to. And they've got a thought balloon that kind of shows some idea of what it is that they're thinking about and what's, what's puzzling them. But then there's also the people in the observation room and people watching, watching the user and they've all got their own individual thought balloons, you know, and that, that basically they're all, they're all interpreting what they're hearing from the user differently based on they're filtering it through their experience. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, many of them will be useful, you know, it, that, that that's what you want. You want the whole team to be observing somebody actually having the experience and then filtering it through their understanding of, well, what can we do technologically or what's the history of this or, you know, all of those things. So, mm. uh, 
you don't really, that's why, that's why the old model of, well, we have a consultant come in and run the test and then they write a report and they draw conclusions is pretty lame. You know, mm. it, does, it doesn't really serve that same purpose of drawing on all the, the, the group experience. Mm. So, but People yeah. that I talk to practitioners and myself included sometimes have difficulty convincing people that aren't core to the product to spectate or observe the tests, right? Short of compulsion. <laughs> how do you get people? How do you get people in the room? Um, compulsion is always good uh, if you can manage it, you know, uh, but um, I guess I, I am probably un I don't know if I'm unrealistically optimistic about this. I kind of think that if you can, if you can get people, if you can trick people into the room, then they will get it. They will understand the value of it. That it's mostly people who haven't done it before who, mm -hmm. who do not perceive the value in actually spending any time doing it. Um, uh, so I try to tell people, you, you know, one thing you need to do is to, is to get everybody to at least come to some, you know, that mm -hmm. you'll make a certain number of converts, some unexpected, um, based on the fact that they've seen some. My favorite recommendation was always, if you're starting out introducing, uh, you know, it to the team, then do a test of your competitors. Mm -hmm. you know, um, because everybody's interested in your competitor in their competitors. And also, you're not going to make anybody look bad in house because you're not testing your stuff, you're testing their stuff. So nobody's going to be reluctant because they don't want their stuff to look bad. Um, and there's no reason why you can't do it. You know, if somebody's got a public facing site out there, you basically mm -hmm. have a perfect right to, you know, tr have some people try using it. Um, so that's always been my main recommendation for, for, for basically tricking people into getting, getting a taste for the, for the process. And yeah, that forcing them is good. You know, if you can manage it, um, probably not as good as other things. Uh, great snacks, you know, I recommend spend <laughs> as much money as you can on snacks uh, and yeah. lunch and whatever. Uh, and just make it easy. You know, I mean, that was part of the part of the, 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 the notion of, of rocket surgery was test once a month with three users, you know, because mm -hmm. a it's it's such a low bar for recruiting and the effort required to, to produce the tests. Mm -hmm. That you'll keep doing it because the trick is the, the problem is you won't keep doing it that's the problem the problem is there's a tendency to have enthusiasm for it at first and then it gradually drifts off and what you want to do is establish that this is our practice and mm. so if you do it once a month and you have three people recruiting requirements are low attendance is really easy you know you're testing down the hall from where all these people are uh if you you know if any of us ever get back to working on site again um, yeah. and, uh, and, and then you do the debrief with everybody who came to them and they get to have a voice in that process, you know? So to me, that's like an ideal setup for a number of reasons. And it works remotely. It works just as well remotely. I mean, almost as well. I'm not sure mm. if the debriefing is going to work quite as well. I haven't seen one. Somebody try to do one in, in zoom, um, mm. Um, but th as far as testing and observing the tests, it works fine. The only problem is that as with any any remote thing, I mean, I, I never do anything remote apart from something like this, of course, where I don't end up drifting off and doing email, you know, after 15 minutes. So, <laughs> well, I haven't heard you typing on the keyboard, so I suppose we're okay so far. <laughs> I have to imagine that that, that that would, you know, you'd have a fair share of that with usability testing. So you have to keep it kind of crisp. But mm -hmm. um, it also makes it easier for people. You know, it makes it easier. They can just sit at their desk and do it, or you can actually record them and people can watch them um, mm. you know, at their leisure. Not that they will, but no, just a good. Yeah, we'd yeah. be deluded to expect that people would be watching that over That's Netflix not... in the evening. Yeah, yeah, exactly. One of the maxims in rocket surgery is focus ruthlessly on solving the most important problems. Mm -hmm. How do you determine what that problem or problems are? That's what I think of as the debriefing is mm. that basically 
I, in fact, I even I came up with a, a I came up with a process for it that's in the book, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which which just between you and me, although I have admitted this publicly before, I just made it up. You know, uh, <laughs> when I was writing the book, I I, <laughs> I thought I thought what would be you know what would based on what I've done and seen done, what would be a good process that the point of which was to figure out what were the most significant problems and then figure out what you were going to do about them. Because I really do believe in this, that, that part of the problem is that you tend to not focus on the most significant problems, you know, because they're, they have a history and people believe that they're going to be hard to solve or they believe that they're going to be solved by the next round of technology that gets adopted or whatever, none of which is ever mm. true. Um, mm. and so is there, that's why you go back to the, a site and you see the same really bad problem there that's been there for years, you know, mm. that losing them money. I mean, I, I'm always appalled by that. I see something and I say, wait a minute, I ran into this problem. It wasn't just because I did something stupid. It was, I have to figure that at least 10% of the people who come through here run into that problem. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to give up just because I'm, I'm, you know, I sort of whatever. But you mm. have to figure that that half those people are going to give up because of that problem. Mm. Uh, and what does that mean in terms of in terms of money and in terms of satisfaction and whatever? So anyway, um, but but so I made up the, I made up that process, which basically says while people are observing what they write down, they can keep as many notes as they want, but what they write down for each participant that they observe is the three most significant problems that they actually observe that problem person run into. Not things that they thought about while that session was going on, but actual problems that they observed that that person had. And so you write down your three most significant. And so you end up with a sheet that's, you know, it's a handout that that basically you end up writing down nine problems if you watch three Mm. tests. And then you bring that into the debriefing session and you go around and everybody gets, everybody picks from their nine, they pick the three that they thought were most significant and they contribute that and you keep a running tally on the board and you end up with some that have 20 check, you know, 10 check boxes, check check marks after them because everybody Mm -hmm. thought that was a serious problem. And -hmm. you go around and everybody makes their contribution. Oh, and then based on that, you then reorder the list for what, were, you know, came across as the most serious problems. And then you work your way down that list saying, okay, what are we going to do about this, you know, in the next month to take this out of the category of being a really serious problem into either being a problem that not many people have, it might still be serious, but almost nobody has it, or that uh, uh, people still have, but it's not a serious problem for them anymore. And my Mm -hmm. take on it was, there's pretty much always something you can tweak in that situation to make that change. Uh, there may be some things that are just, they're like so God awful and so built into the core of the, the customer experience or the, the idea of the product that you can't tweak them. But I think there almost always is something. Mm. That was my whole model for debriefing mm. was uh, you use it as a sieve to uh, to make sure that you're only looking at the most serious problems. And, and I love the maxim that you came up with for tweaking, which was when right. fixing problems always do the least that you can yeah. do. <laughs> yeah. It's so exactly. important. Exactly. Cause you've seen, you've seen people get sucked into, into redesigns, you mm. know, when, when yes, the redesign would be nice, but you're not going to end up doing it. But on the other hand, there is a tweak you could make. There's a simple change that you could make that would make things a lot better. Wouldn't fix them. Wouldn't be mm. perfect, but mm. would that improve the situation that, that you have and if, you know, r- quickly right away. Mm. So, so I made that up, but then I actually got, I actually got a nice amount of feedback from people who said, yeah, we did the debriefing this way and worked really well. So. I think that's coming back to that conversation we had earlier about the importance and the, the difficulty and doing the thinking and then distilling the thinking down into something that's useful for other people. And that's definitely proved to be something that's been really valuable for the community. Yeah. When does it make sense to start doing usability testing? As early as possible. You know, I always say if you got, if it's never too early to start, if you've got a, a sketch of the homepage, you know, of this thing, that's just a germ of an idea, then, Mm. Take, take that sketch, show it to some people and say, 
what do you think this is? You know, what's, what's your understanding of what this is and what you could do with it and what it's for. Mm. And if, I would say if their description, uh, if their description matches what you had in mind, then get, you know, get a bigger napkin and, you know, keep sketching. Uh, um, hmm. But odds are that from showing it to like five people and having them give you that description, you will have a light bulb go off over your head of, oh, right, that was, that's not obvious that this is what we were doing with that, you know, <laughs> and how much time have you spent? Like none. Hmm. You know? And Jacob Nielsen pointed that out. He made the case years ago about, and he had the, ran the numbers for how much it costs to make changes later in the process as opposed to earlier in the process. And it's, it's ridiculous. It's purely, you know, logarithmic. Uh, in mm. terms of it's something that business people will understand. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Steve, are you up for some rapid fire questions? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you had a very similar reaction to Laura Klein agreed, when I asked you this question. You can, wait, we've already agreed that you can ask me about anything. So now we have a <laughs> You can ask me about anything and they're going to be rapid fire questions. This sounds like sounds like hazardous duty, but um but yes, please go ahead. Just, just seeking informed consent, one might say. Yeah. All right, so they're scenario based. And let's just see how we go. Oh sure. So the the first one is a UX designer wants to usability test a prototype of a new feature, but they're having trouble finding the right participants. What should they do? Uh, um, they should lower their standards. You know, my, you know, my answer to this, <laughs> but the other people might not. Okay. <laughs> why should, why should they lower their standards? They should lower their standards because they because uh, nothing should keep them from doing the testing. It, it, recruiting is hard. Recruiting is the hardest part. And the more finicky you are about making sure that your participants are a perfect map onto your intended actual users, the harder recruiting tends to be. Uh, and it's the reason why people don't do more testing. And I would argue that the fact is that uh, people who do this for a living know that you will still learn f what you need to learn by testing is as much as you can have re representative users you should you should and mm. but you there's nothing wrong with having a mix of people who are representative users and people who are just spoon-fed the information that they need to know that representative users would know that they don't know it's nothing wrong mm. with giving them clues with telling them Here's what you want to do. Here's what this thing typically costs. You know, you can you can spoon feed them whatever you need to spoon feed them. And, but that the fact is that the the interface and the user experience should be so clear that even people who don't have the domain knowledge should be able to figure it out in most cases. And where there are cases where your people who aren't your intended audience can't figure it out, then you just do the thought experiment where you say, well, did they have a hard time not getting this? because they were not actual users or because it's just confusing. And I would mm -hmm. argue you can always answer that question really easily as long mm -hmm. as you ask it. So mm -hmm. there's, there's nothing, uh, you know, and I have, a, I have, a, I, one of the things I did in, in rocket surgery that I really liked was I had an FAQ at the end of each chapter, uh, which turns out to be a wonderful writing device because inevitably if you're writing something nonfiction like that, you end up with stuff that you can't quite fit in. You know, and you're going to have to really mm. work hard to come up with a rhetorical flow that will, you know, that will allow you to cover this point. And, but on the other hand, if you have an FAQ at the end of the chapter, you just throw it there. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't matter. You have to, you don't have to go through all that writing struggle. Um, but one of them was basically, you're only testing three people, so it's not statistically significant. And my answer was, yep. If somebody somebody asks you that, somebody's going to ask you and say, "Well, what? it's not statistically significant," and your answer should be, "Yep, absolutely. We're testing three. No statistical. No point in even gathering statistics." Um, but uh, the fact is, people have been doing this for years, and it works. It gets you the insights that you need. Mm. You know, end of explanation. Mm. And so sort of the same thing with representative users is, it just works. You know, I mean, come and watch some, and you'll see that it works. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. But the main thing that 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 you want to make the recruiting easier, you want to because because 
difficult or the difficulty of recruiting is what will make you stop doing it. So then you've stopped. So there yeah. you're, you're dead. So important. Yeah, very important. These are all softballs, as we would say over here, aren't they? They're like slow pitches. I, I was excited <laughs> to be tricked. <laughs> well, yeah. I wouldn't do that to you. I wouldn't do that to you, Steve. I know you wouldn't. I know you wouldn't. So number two, you're working on a non-screen-based experience. In okay. this case, it's one that relies on speech as input. How should you approach evaluating its usability? You know, my problem is I have a hard time seeing how any, and, and I would have to, if I did do a third edition uh, I, of Don't Make Me Think, I would have to talk about uh, uh, UX in these different modalities. And that was one of the things that I, that suddenly light bulb went over my head. I figured out how to do that without spending years doing it. Um, but for me, my problem is, and I'll probably overemphasize this, uh, uh, I'm probably biased, but I don't think there's that much difference. You mm -hmm. know, if it's a speech interface, basically you come up with, with a, you come up with a task for them to do and uh, you have them do the task. And at the same time that they do the task, they do think aloud and they comment on what it was that they were trying to do and what they were thinking about and how, and then, and their reaction to what the response was from the system. That's it. You know, I just don't, I just mm. don't see the difference in most of these modalities. Mm. Yeah. Why make it more complicated than it has to be? It works. Observations, powerful. You know, you're, tr you're trying to get the same thing. You're trying to get them to, uh, share their internal, their thought process. You're trying to get them to mm. do the thing and share their thought process. And from that, that's how you get the insights. Mm. I know. I, like I say, I may be, you know, I may be biased, but it's just always struck me that way. So I am Are you ready for that. Yes. It's okay to be biased as long as you know that that's the case. <laughs> Are you ready for softball number three? Yes, please. Okay. You're a UX researcher in charge of usability testing of a product. How should you think about your role within the wider team? Okay. And that's, I mean, people are spending a ton of time talking about that now um, bec because so many teams now have UX people and they're trying to figure out, partly they're, they're going through the whole land grab thing of trying to figure out, well, who actually gets to make the decisions here? You know? <laughs> are the UX people allowed to tell us how it has to be designed or or, you know, are we telling them? And, and that, unfortunately, that hasn't changed. It's still going on. In fact, probably becoming more intense because now there are the, you know, the UX people actually have a seat at the table and, mm. uh, and design has become such a freaking sloppy term these days. You know, it's like, every, is everybody a designer? Is nobody a designer? I think those are the two, two options. You can um, thank 3M for that. Uh, yeah. Is yeah. That they put the post-it notes the, oh, everyone's the now a designer. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that's all you need a wall and some post-it notes. Right. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, I feel like that's such a large discussion. That's such a large topic that will only, that will only settle out over the next couple of years. You know, I don't know mm -hmm. if there's even anything smart to say about that. I think you need to be, you need to be respectful of other people's turf. You need to, feel like I, I part of, I guess I read something recently. It basically said, you need to picture yourself as you're serving the process. You know, you're serving mm -hmm. the as, as a UX researcher, you're serving the needs of the designers and the developers, you know, and it's best to view it that way. Uh, the one thing you don't want to do is get polarized and feel like you're telling them what to do. Feel like you, you, for you to have, for you to have your rightful place in the process, then you know better than they do and you need to be telling them what to do. And I think most people are relatively savvy about that, although maybe I'm just optimistic about human nature, but I, f I feel like most people kind of get that. But mm -hmm. the more the environment of the organization that they're in is competitive in that kind of way, you know, mm -hmm. um, the, the more you're going to tend to slip, you, the more you're going to feel the need to assert yourself and assert the fact that you have value and, um, whatever. But I think the way you assert that you have value is by supporting these other people and by, you know, making it clear that, that what you're there to do is to provide them with insights mm. that will make their work better. Mm. And, uh, that's, but, but on the other hand, these are all people 
and <laughs> it's going to be messy. So, um, I don't know. I guess I don't feel, I guess I don't feel like the, I feel like everybody's looking to say, well, what should the, what should management be doing to define these roles so that it works? And mm -hmm. I feel like that's kind of not going to work. You know, it's like defining the roles is, is going to make some people feel like they've been curtailed and other people feel more entitled. And I feel like you need to create an atmosphere in which people understand that everybody's making contributions and that the UX researchers are not there to cut off the designers at the knees and you know, yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. But, but again, I, I don't have to do that. You know, I mean, I'm, this is really easy. I'm just sitting in my basement. So <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I don't have to, I'm glad I don't have to handle any of that or manage any of that. So sitting in your basement, I'm about to pitch you the, the fourth and final rapid fire before we bring the show down to a close. So this is where your organization is early on in their UX journey, and mm -hmm. you're trying to get the stakeholders, the important ones to see the value of usability testing, but it seems to be falling on deaf ears. What do you do? Um, well, I already told you my, my, my favorite, which is trick them into coming is, is do the competitive te competitor testing yeah. and trick them into coming and, uh, and seeing how well the process works at sort of no cost to them on topic. That's of a great interest to them, their competitors, getting, 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 just getting them in the room somehow. I feel, I feel like you're either, either people are going to see the value in it and become converts or they're not. Hmm. You know, you, yeah, some, some people doesn't matter what they see. They still, they still won't believe. Right. Mm. right. It's very hard to change people's minds if they, if they don't want to be changed. I think it's very hard to change people's minds about anything. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I think people change their mind very rarely, very rarely. Mm. My That's why it's so important to find the allies that do believe and, mm. and build your practice around yeah. that. There you go. Mm. So bring the show down to a close. Don't feel constrained by the realm of technology in this question, but what do you see as the greatest usability challenge that we are facing as a society? Good question. The usability challenge. See, the problem is when you think about a challenge, I, I, I come right back to, uh, I, I definitely shouldn't say this. I always say something against, against my own interest in any, <laughs> uh, but I, I just, I feel like, I feel like, um, I feel like social media has been nothing but bad. I feel like social media has, yes, there are, there are upsides and benefits to social media and things that you can point to where it has in some ways improved people's lives. I feel like the net net is minus a thousand percent. I feel like it's, it's, it's caused more, uh, bad effect in society than almost anything in many years. And I, I mean, I'm biased because I live in the United States and we like practically lost our country because mm -hmm. of social media. <laughs> no question. I mean, there couldn't mm -hmm. have been a Trump without social media, anything, anything that improves that, I guess. So it's not, so it's, so that's, it doesn't answer your usability question in terms of usability. Uh, I mean, we have an example right here where, where, uh, um, distribution of vaccines. Uh, they obviously uh, Trump had been saying for a long time that he had he had plans that they had plans to distribute the vaccine. They had no plans whatsoever. They had none mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. when when the Biden Biden people came in, and they finally and the Biden people wouldn't let them talk to the, uh, the Trump wouldn't let them talk to the people who were responsible for it for months. Mm -hmm. They kept separate and wouldn't let them, wouldn't let them share any information with Biden. When Biden people finally got their hands on it, they were like, not to my surprise, there was no plan. There was nothing. And so they basically had to come up with a hurry for supporting, um, how, how, how does this stuff get distributed? Yeah. Uh, you know, what are the guidelines for who gets it? And, uh, importantly, how do people book, how do people book them? You know, and there mm -hmm. was nothing 
place. And so they had to very hurriedly, a couple of, couple of commercial entities stepped in and said, well, we've got a system that'll work and they weren't very good. Uh, and so it was a huge mess and it was not, and it didn't scale well. The things that were done didn't scale well at all. So there was that kind of, um, and a lot of it was sort of usability problems. I mean, some of it was mm. the QA level, but I'm increasingly thinking QA problems are usability problems. You know, if something's broken, then it's not usable. You, mm. know, you really need to be aware of that. You really need to, to include that in usability. So it's been disturbing to me that that caused people so much, so much havoc. You know, you've had people, you've had people who were, uh, in groups that were supposed to be able to get vaccinations at a given point in time who qualified for it they were you know 75 and older or whatever and mm. they went online to try and sign up and they ran into just horrible usability problems so it just mm. stuff was broken and then they get disconnected but there were there were basic things like you would go in and enter all this information about your you'd, you'd go in you'd find an appointment that was available You'd enter all the information that you needed to register for it, and then you would click on submit, and that slot was gone. And then you would have to re-enter that information again about yourself mm. each time. This is not that, that you know. This is is not not rocket surgery. You know that <laughs> that, that 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 those systems should have been storing that information. Uh, you know, uh, and it made an, a horrible experience, which is compounded by the fact that. A lot of the people who were trying to do it were over 75. Mm. <laughs> you know, mm. or their relatives were trying to do it remotely for their relatives who were over 75. I guess that kind of thing, I'm not sure what the category is for that. That that. Uh, mm. It's a meta, I, meta level, really, isn't it? You know, it's, it is. effect, it's it something is. that affects everybody. And it's all, yeah, and it's also related to, to uh, you know, health events, massive public events, public needs. You know, um, mm. that that uh, there uh, we should be better at that. But, Are you up for playing a quick game? Uh, okay, you're going to ask me. You're going to ask me for my favorite curse word. Is it that that game. Well, it doesn't. It does involve words, and there may be curses just depending on what what I ask you. <laughs> <laughs> this game's pretty simple. It's called. What's the first word that comes to mind? Oh and yeah, it can be more than one word. It could be a sentence. It doesn't really matter, but just the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. So I've got. I did, three... I did one of these last week, so I'm, I'm so I, I'm I'm ready to go. Okay, I'll Excellent. use the same. I'll use the same words in the same order, regardless of what. <laughs> That's cheating, Steve. <laughs> so I've got well, three I words. I don't, I don't think I get a passing grade. So, but okay, yes, <laughs> go ahead. The, the first word is writing. Uh, hard. Still hard. Mm -hmm. Second, hard. second words, road to nowhere. Road to nowhere. Uh, David Byrne, actually. And there's a story behind that, which is there's a talking head song uh, uh, called We're on the Road to Nowhere. And it was actually the song that my wife and I used as the uh, recessional at our wedding. <laughs> What's I love it. It's such a great story. Amusement of, of some relatives. But the song, if you look up the song lyric, the lyric is, is actually perfect. We know where we're going. We don't, we, we, we don't know where we're going. We know where we've been. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so yes, Road to Nowhere. I love it. That, that was your recessional. It was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> and the last, the last word is boxfish ah beautiful beautiful boxfish are, are just they're just they're charming there we'll put a link to an image of a boxfish in the show yeah. notes yeah yeah there are many endearing animals but boxfish are just great thinking about your experiences in this field steve if you could share one bit of wisdom with all of the people who are studying and working in UX today, what would you say to them? I would say it's a it's 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 really interesting work. It remains really interesting work. Everybody I know who's been doing it forever, professionally, they like they they never get bored with it, uh, and uh, and 
compared to real work, it's pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I guess, I guess I, I, I highly, I highly recommend it. It'll, it'll, uh, it'll retain your interest. So true. Steve, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you for so generously sharing your knowledge and experiences with the UX community and for all of your contributions to it over the past 30 years. Thanks. That's very nice. I, I appreciate it. I'm glad you asked. And, um, and maybe I'll uh, see you in Auckland someday. <laughs> I, know, I hope 20, so. I don't have about 20 hour air trips anymore. I'm kind of. We'll just beam you in via Zoom. Oh, there you go. Or right, or 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 if uh, is it Musk? Who's do, who's doing the, the the tunnel the tunnel thing? Maybe. Oh, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Look, you've you've played such an important role in shaping the way that hundreds of thousands of people think about UX and the importance of usability. So, really, huge thanks to you for persevering through the agony of writing and sharing yeah. your gifts with us <laughs> and the world. Oh, thank you again. Very nice. I appreciate it. Steve, if people want to find out more about you and what you're up to, what is the best way for them to do that? Um, they can follow me on Twitter at S, S Krug. Uh, although I don't, I don't tweet very much cause I like people who don't tweet very much. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, uh, if, or they can check my website at either Steve Krug.com or sensible.com. Thanks, Steve. And to everyone who's tuned in, it's been great to have you here as well. Everything we've covered, including where to find Steve, plus any of the resources that we've mentioned, including a picture of a box fish, will be posted in the show notes on YouTube. If you've enjoyed the show and you want to hear more great conversations like this with world-class leaders in design, UX, and product, don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe. And until next time, keep being brave.